Dear friends, my happiness and joy is so immense to see you one more time. And I thank God that he has given us this great time so that we could interact with one another, enrich our fellowship, and grow in Christian maturity. I thank God for this wonderful evening. I thank God for Reverend Dev Butran for having given me this wonderful opportunity to share his words. And I also thank the secretary, treasurer, members of the LCC, and all people connected thereof. And it is a wonderful time to be with you. And before we go into the meditation for this day, shall we all bow down our heads in prayer? Eternal God, loving Savior, we come to you with all our burdens and anxieties so that you could dispel all the burdens from our shoulder and from our heart. We have quite a lot of anxieties in this world. And now, Lord, as we come in your presence, we know that you are here to give us solace and comfort and also to grant us your grace so that we could lead a wonderful life along with you as your witnesses. Even today, as we are at your feet, teach us, Master, as you talk to your disciples and speak to us in a very special manner so that our hearts be illuminated to know your intentions in our life. We commit ourselves, speak to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Dear friends, these days are known as Lent. In the Eastern tradition, the Lent begins from Epiphany Day, when Jesus manifested himself to the Gentiles. And that is nearly more than 60 days. And the Sundays are not included in the Lent. Whereas in the East, Western tradition, Lent begins from Ash Wednesday, and we don't include Sunday as well. When we talk about Lent, it simply means, as the pastor would have already told you, Lent means spring. That means freshness, newness. And newness comes, uh, this is the time for newness. The newness comes not automatically. Newness will come when we invite Jesus Christ in our heart. Newness comes when there is repentance. When we repent of our sins, then God manifests his glory to us. Without repentance, no one can approach the grace and the, um, the presence of God. We cannot have access to, access in the presence of God. There must be a repentance. Time and again, Bible tells us when people repent of their sins, there was great revival. Bible is the authentic evidence for that. And today, as we meditate on, the, on Lent, it is the repentance. Another thing, the Lent also tells us that we are dust. We are dust and we shall return to dust. The finality, not infiniteness, the finiteness of every human being. When we begin this journey on this earth, it is, Lent reminds us, I am a dust. I will go back to the dust where I emerged from. And again, this word Lent also telling us, lending. Lending is what God has lent to us. What God has lent in our life, God has lent the very life itself. The life that I live today is not of my merit. It is not of my good work, but because of God's grace. And God has given this life as a, he's lent it out this life to me. So God is telling one more time through Jesus Christ, live out a worthy life because you won't have another life to live with. This is the only life. God has lent it out this life for us. And in these days, we are given uh, the grace of God, Jesus Christ, to meditate on the eye sayings of Jesus Christ that is recorded 
in the Gospel of John. Gospel of John is normally called as Gospel of Signs. If you read other synoptic gospels, you will come across quite a lot of miracles performed by Jesus Christ. Quite a lot of miracles. If you open Matthew, Mark, Luke, you will come across quite a lot of miracles every page. And you will come across that Jesus Christ performed miracles so that people understood who he was and who he is. Who he is. But whereas John tells us that this is not miracle. These are all signs. Signs for what? And he spells out the same thing in his own gospel at the last fag end of his gospel. That is in chapter 20, verse 31. He says that you might believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah. Jesus performed miracle signs so that you and I might believe that he is Messiah. And we read seven miracle and signs spread throughout the Gospel of John. And in that, we come across that Jesus was pronouncing the word, I am. And we always find the I sayings almost precede or at the end of the miracles performed by Jesus Christ. Whenever we talk about I, uttered by Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ wants to reiterate that he is none other than the very God who pronounced his name Yahweh on the Mount Sinai. Yahweh in, in the Hebrew terms, whereas in Greek it is I am, ego. And, and, um, and Jesus Christ used quite often uh, almost seven um, um, words and seven incidences where he said that I am. And this particular meditation for this day that you find in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 to 6 and, on, and in 7. Dear friends, in order to understand the saying of Jesus Christ, we need to understand this particular incident not in isolation. You cannot understand this particular passage simply reading this passage. In verse number 7, Jesus Christ was saying that, I am the door, or I am the gate for the sheep. In order to understand this particular saying, and this chapter 10 contains two I sayings. One is found in verse number 7, I am the door, and subsequently, in verse number 13, Jesus Christ saying that I am the good shepherd. Two different uh, words implying the same thing. But in order to understand I am the door, we need to look in, within the uh, framework of the gospel. When we read chapter 9, the whole incident begins from chapter 9. Uh, can you tell me what is recorded in chapter 9 of God, John's Gospel. Don't look at your Bible. You must be knowing that thoroughly because you are born and brought up. <laughs> this ninth chapter tells about healing of a blind man. Healing of a blind man. And we read that this man was blind from his birth. And the first part talks about Jesus Christ heal the blind man. And it was a Sabbath day. We read in the particular um, passage, John chapter 9, soon after this man, blind man, was healed, he was interrogated. He was questioned. Questioned by whom? Verse number 13 says, it is not the leaders, but Pharisees. Pharisees came and asked the boy, the man who was blind, who healed him on the Sabbath day. And so also we find in verse number 16, the word again, Pharisees appear one more time. And throughout the ninth chapter we come across, it appears either as the leader of the Jews 
or as the Pharisee. And when we talk about Pharisee, who are these Pharisees? The Pharisees are the custodians of the, uh, of the law. And they are the custodian. They consider themselves as the custodians of the practices of the normal Jew. They are, they are the one who interpret the law that was given by God through Moses. During the time of Jesus Christ, there were more than 616 interpretations on the Ten Commandments. And these Pharisees always tell, tell the people what they got to do, and they consider themselves as the custodians. And they always consider themselves as the teachers. And, and, and again, these uh, Pharisees always consider they are the shepherd because they lead the congregate the Jewish people the way in which need to, they go, they need to walk. And therefore, these Pharisees always taught them the way the Jew got to go. And this incident took place on a Sabbath day and there was interrogation by the Pharisees, not only this blind man, but to the parents. If you read ninth chapter very clearly, go back home, read the passage clearly. And they were interrogating the parents. Parents, they want to escape themselves by saying, the boy is of that age. You can ask him. We need not to tell him, and he is able to answer your question. And one more time, the man was summoned by the Pharisees, and he said that Jesus, and he very clearly said, and if you read the particular passage, he said, whoever says that, that he followed Jesus Christ, he was excommunicated. He was not a part of the Jewish community. And here, this boy, this man, was summoned and he was asked, and he responded, an evil man cannot perform miracles. How an evil person can open a blind man? And in the particular passage, we read that he recognized and he confessed that who Jesus Christ is. And therefore, what was the end, you see? If you read the chapter, you'll find he was excommunicated. He was thrown out. He was not a part or parcel of Jewish community. He cannot enter into the synagogue. He cannot offer offer trace in the synagogue and in other places. And at the end of this passage, we come across that in verse 1934, we come across, and in the end of the passage, we come across, Jesus saw him and is asked him, um, um, the, and, and the man confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, and this man was added. The leaders who said they are the shepherds, they excommunicated the man. Whereas Jesus Christ, he was inclusive. He added this man, and this blind man became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is the context in which Jesus was saying it is the, uh, it is the automatic outcome of ninth chapter. We come across that in the ninth, uh, in the in the, um, uh, in the in the ninth chapter, we come across the attitude of the of the Pharisees. And Pharisees, they were very much judgmental in their attitude. They do not want to encourage people, but on the other hand, by saying the interpretation to the law, they want to limit or by, uh, they want to suppress liberty given by, G by the Lord. The Sabbath was, and Jesus himself said, Sabbath was given in order that we must be re um, rest on the day. Man was not created for Sabbath. Sabbath was created for man. And therefore, Jesus Christ says that even if you are excommunicated, even you are not a part of the community, if you are excluded, if you are excommunicated, remember, I am here to welcome you. I am here to engulf you with my hand. I am here to embrace you with my love. 
And since these Pharisees were considering they were the uh, shepherd, Jesus tries to portray who is the shepherd and what is the gate. Quite often when we need to look back the geographical background of Judea, Judea is not a very, very um, flourishing um, soil. It is a very dry soil. And you don't know that you must go and see Holy Land at least once in a while. You go and see uh, how uh, the land is made up of Galilee and, and this uh, Carmel and the are flourishing side. And it's flourished with quite a lot of greeneries where the river Jordan plays through. Whereas Judea is a dry country and you can't find uh, fields but barren land. And in the barren land there are some grasses so that the cattle may go and, grass, um, and gaze in the, in, the, in, the, in the land. And in the villages, and even today, if you go to a village down south or elsewhere in the village, you'll find that the cattle have a kind of a shed in the, uh, out in the, in the field. They used to have enclosure and they will have only one opening. And only one opening, uh, the gate, you will have the gate. And with that gate, the sheep will go in and go out. And anyone wants to enter in, uh, if a right man, if he's a perfect man, he goes through the gate. But if he's a thief and he got to claim, the, claim on the wall, even today you can find it in the village side. What is the role of the gate and the shepherd? And they are synonymous and they use interrelated. A shepherd is the gate. In what sense? As I said, there will be only one way to go in of the cattle and the shed. But Quite often, the sheep and the shepherd used to lie down in the gate, in the, uh, as acting himself as the gate, so that anyone who wants to barge in, anyone who wants to go in, they cannot bypass the shepherd. So therefore, shepherd and the door, one and the same, shepherd he places and puts his bed on the uh, doorway and he himself acts as the door. And we see that the chapter 10 talks about that Jesus Christ is, is inclusive. He includes everyone. We read in the chapter 10 that um, Jesus uh, is the door in which that anyone who wants to come in shall go in only by the door, not by any other means. If anyone wants to go inside, if you can by scaling the wall or breaking the wall, Jesus says he is a thief. And therefore, Jesus says, in the context during the time of Jesus Christ, that sheep, and Jesus Christ is saying that sheep knows the voice of the shepherd. And also, sheep knows who is the shepherd. And Jesus Christ says, I am the shepherd and I am the door. My sheep knows my, my voice. They recognize my voice. Mutual understanding. If you are the um, sheep of Jesus Christ, you and I need to know the voice of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was voice is quite crystal and clear. He talks at every juncture of life. You cannot ex escape by saying, I did not hear the voice of the shepherd. The silent, the, the, the silent voice of God. Every time it comes and speaks into, into our hearts and into our ears, God speaks. And when we hear the sound, how much we reciprocate to the sound. And we know in the Holy Scripture, in the book of 2 Kings, we come, of 1 Kings, we come across a man 
who was hiding in a cave and when he heard the voice of God, he, came, he heard quite a lot of things. There was fire, there was thunder, there was earthquake and the Lord was not there. When the man heard the small voice of calm, he covered his face and came out of the cave and, asked, uh, and stood before God. Dear friends, recognizing the voice of the shepherd. The voice of the shepherd is repeatedly addressed to each one of us. How much we answer to the call of the shepherd. And, and again, we talk about the shepherd and the, the, the gate. And, and when we see, we read chapter 10, verse 1, and we come across translations vary. And one translation says, surely. Another translation says, truly. And whatever it may be, it implies the same thing. And it comes from a Greek word and a Hebrew word that is amen. And this is the reputation. If you read the John's Gospel, there are 23 times, double time, amen appears. The 23 times in which God reassuringly is telling his hearers, reassuringly telling his followers, surely, surely, amen, amen, I am the gate. Surely, surely, I am the good shepherd. And in this uh, uh, particular point, in the first six verses, Jesus Christ is talking about how uh, sheep understands his master's voice and how the master reciprocate and both are reciprocating each other. And when we read six verse, disciples could not understand. And verse number six says, they did not understand what Jesus Christ was saying. And therefore, Jesus wants to tell them in a clear sense. Jesus talked with them in the parables and in a metaphoric language. And Jesus wanted to say in a special manner, simple manner, that could be visualized. That could be easily understood by the hearers, his disciples. He said, I am the gate. I am the gate, what does it imply? Gate is the thing by night. What the gate does, it does to keep the sheep together, intact. And any sheep that goes into inside the shed, the door protects and, the, uh, and keeps them together. Therefore, Jesus Christ is saying, I am the door means I am keeping you together. I don't want you to scatter around in the world of sorrow. I want you to, um, to be together because in mutual encouragement. It talks about mutual encouragement. Church is a family. Church is a family where we mutually encourage one another. And as we come every Sunday, we name, quite often we are very superficial and we always see only the face. But we do not understand the pain and pathos in the need of a particular individual. But Jesus Christ is saying, the relationship, putting them together, should go further, one step further. Knowing them, knowing them as they are. We always tend to be superficial. But Jesus Christ is saying, know them. How will you know them? When they come together. Interact with one another. It's a good thing that every Sunday on any other day, we share coffee. But what do we share there? Coffee time is provided to each one of us, at least for interaction. But how far our interaction penetrates other, 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 other people's mind? Our conversation, how much we influence other people, how much we give ears to hear the needs of other people, togetherness. 
Togetherness involves listening. Togetherness involves sharing. Togetherness involves caring. And Paul gives the analogy. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about members of the body. And he says, if any member pains, then the whole body suffers. And any member is recognized and glorified. The whole body is recognized and glorified. And that's what Paul says. And that is the church. If anybody undergoes pain, agony, and suffering, the church as the body, the togetherness, it gives us and it pays a way to participate. Participating one another's um, pain and agony. Dear friends, this morning, this, I'm sorry, this evening, as we are gathered, Jesus said, you are in my fold. I am the, sh um, the door. When I am the door, how much you are, you are together, you are, you are together. But do you recognize who is your neighbor? Jesus, and when Jesus was uh, interacting with the lawgiver, and that lawgiver asked the question, who is my neighbor? So very, very important question. Who is my neighbor? Is he of my own community? Is he of my own clan? Is he of my own family? Jesus says, my neighbor is those who, he, those who are and those who, who is in need. Dear friends, togetherness. Church is made for that. Church is, is a gift of God where which we brought together from north, south, east and west and God has brought us together. Our vernacular might be different. Our habits may be different. Cultural variation. But we are brought together by Jesus Christ so that we could emerge together. We could build together. So therefore, when Jesus Christ says, I am the gate, it, it tells that togetherness. Gate provides the facility of being together. And having, and Jesus himself already says in the parable, parable of the lost sheep. This one particular sheep lost and it is not in the, uh, in the fold and it gone astray. But still, the shepherd went after it, searching for it. And today, that is a great concern for us. Do we have concern for those who are in our midst and those who are unable to come? They, were una they are unable to come because of their age, because of their sickness, because they might experience some hardness, some, some evil thing or bad thing in their life. They are unable to come to the church. And do we ever notice that? Have we ever visited them? And Jesus said at the judgment seat, and he said, I was sick, you visited me. So visiting the, the lost sheep is visiting Jesus Christ. And, and it, it inbuilt the togetherness. And again, we see that togetherness involves that mutual respect. Understanding on a mutual respect means we regard Jesus Christ and in the same manner, I regard my co-worker, my co-worshipper as God's gift for the church. Recognize them. God did not create us, everybody, in a unique manner. In a, he created us in a unique manner. He did not create us as a carbon copy. Say, I have this habit. I cannot say Mr. Winfred, Dr. Winfred has the same thing. He is unique. And also each one of us are unique. And that's the way how God has created. When we are together, recognize each other's talent. Recognize and you, um, use those, all these talents so that there will be mutual growth, mutual understanding. And again, when we talk about the togetherness, 
And it also not, is not only togetherness, it is by night, it is the safeguarding of the sheep. The sheep are safeguarded by the door in the night. In the night, there will be, they, are, they used to have thieves, they used to scale the wall. And it is said that in the ancient Palestine and even today, that when the shepherd used to be killed in order that the sheep may be stolen. Many times shepherds have given their life for the sake of their sheep because it was lying between the sheep and the outside world. And the gate, the shepherd himself become a sacrifice for the sheep. And therefore Jesus Christ says that in the, um, if you are in the uh, gate, you find safe and security. I give my life for your sake. I gave my life on the cross so that you secure life. And therefore, this involves safe and security. And again, Jesus Christ says in further in the 10th chapter, and the one who enters through the gate will find the pasture, will find the satisfaction of life. If you go through the, the gate, Jesus Christ, you'll find the ultimate meaning of your own existence, my own existence. Jesus gives a new understanding my, of my existence. And that's what Jesus said. Those who enter through the door, he goes in and out and find good pastor. And dear friends, new meaning for life. We know that people are changed every day when they commit their ways in the hand of Jesus Christ. And dear friends, do, do we ever surrender our will, surrender our ambitions, surrender our plans and purposes in the hand of God? We always want that I shall be a priori. I come first. Whenever my interests are questioned, whenever I am questioned by other people, when I am not recognized, then I... So, um, my anger becomes multiplied, uh, manifold. And I don't, uh, I don't want to associate myself because I'm not recognized. But Jesus Christ is saying to us that we have a plan and purpose. And Jesus Christ is saying that when we go through and when we are go, uh, in the fold of Jesus Christ, grow through the gate, Jesus says that you will find the very plan and purpose for your life. Dear friends, quite long ago, there lived a boy, a Sikh boy, a Sikh boy who studied in Borbandar, and he studied in a Christian school. When he was too young, his mother used to place him on his lap and she used to teach him the Adi Granth, the, the holy book of Sikhs. And also he, she used to teach all the Idikasas and all Puranas. And this boy was brought up and he was nurtured by his mother. But his mother passed away when he was a young boy. And when he was in the school and he was given with um, New Testament, but in the fury of his anger, he turned, tore it off and put the New Testament in the Bible. And this boy, he has some kind of restlessness in his heart. He was unable to reconcile himself. Whatever he wants to do, there is no reconciliation within himself. There was uh, no peace of mind in his heart. And as he was growing one day, he said, his, his intention, uh, this, the, in the, um, uh, the, the thing that grow more and more, the uncalmness grow more and more in his heart. And one day he said that I will commit myself uh, to suicide before the speeding train that goes near to his house. If God doesn't appear before 3 o'clock, because 3 o'clock 
the train passed by that way. And he was keeping awake throughout the night. The time was tickling and the time was passing. And the boy was eagerly waiting that the guards who were taught by his mother might appear. But alas, at the time was tickling, and before three o'clock, a flame appeared at the corner of his room. And the flame grew more and more, and in the flame he saw not the guard that were told by his mother, but the guard whom he hated, whom whose book he put, in, put into fire, that Jesus Christ appeared in the flame that very moment he found the purpose for his life. The very moment he understood who is the, who is the God and he surrendered himself and he boldly told his father that he became a Christian. Father hated it and therefore he was administered poison. He drank the poison but Jesus gave him life. Poison couldn't act over his body and his, and his life. And he was and is a living witness even today. He was witnessing his life story. And his life is known as, the name was Sundar Singh. But he's called as apostle, Indian apostle, Sadhu Sundar Singh. Always look towards Tibet. He wants to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, he and we do not know what was what happened to Sundar Singh. The last journey, the journey that was he did not return. And we do not know whether he died or whether he died as a morte. We do not know. But this man, he died before he was 35 years of age. And this man found what is the purpose in his life. Jesus, the gate, Jesus Christ will tell us the purpose in our life. Have you ever found the purpose for my life, your life? And that's what the gate says. Those who enter through the gate will find new life, new purpose, new future, new understanding, freshness in the mind. And may the good Lord Continue to add all these things in our life as we journey, continue a journey in these days of Lent. And as we conclude the period of Lent, may we all understand the very purpose, the plan of God for us. Each one of us are given a great purpose. And let us put a hand in the hand of God, saying to Jesus Christ, Lord, you are the gate. Help me to go through you. Help me to find the very purpose of my life. Lord, thank you for the togetherness. Thank you for the mutual respect. Thank you for the mutual understanding of the sheep that are worshiping you together. And also we recognize that you are, us, our, our, you are our guardian. You guard us. And above all, help us to understand the very purpose of my existence. May the good Lord continue to teach us Continue to lead us with the good Lord bless us all. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Good Lord our Father, we thank you for your Son Jesus Christ, who said, I am. I am means that I am the very God. I am the Good Shepherd, uh, the gate. The gate that always brings us together, the togetherness. It also provides security, safe and security. The gate, the one who enters through the gate, always provided with a purpose in the life. Grant us, Master, this night, the very purpose that we are supposed to have. We have lived a life of our own, with our own will and pleasure. And this night, you say that you are the gate and you are the door, and those who enter through you Find life, grant that life, help us to understand it. We commit ourselves, continue to speak to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.